So, I'm Terry Croft, and I have three jobs. I wear three hats. Um, I work at the University of Sheffield as Director of Technical Development and Modernisation. I'm also a director for a higher education grant looking at career development for technicians. And in my spare time, I voluntary uh, I'm the chair of the professional body for technicians, which is the Institute of Science and Technology. And how do you define achievement? Uh, I define achievement by people getting over problems and barriers and keep going for their goals without uh, being deflected by some of the difficulties that everybody has to face in life. I started um, on an estate in Doncaster, which is an engineering town, railway town, pit town. And um, you either grew up and had a job as a train driver, or you went and worked in the pit. And for whatever reason, I just had a fascination with chemistry, uh, right from an early age. So my father bought me a chemistry set for Christmas and when I was 11 years of age I more or less blew up this garden shed uh, but it didn't put me off and I decided I want to be a chemist, analytical chemist in some way and was determined to go that way. So like most young people uh, these days they get deflected by Facebook and uh, Twitter and what have you. I got deflected by music, so I knew I had to get high grades to go to university, uh, but my band and my drumming was more important, so I didn't quite get the grades, so I then decided, well, I still want to be a chemist, so I did my degree and postgraduate degree all part-time, so I still wanted to achieve being uh, an analytical chemist. I then went and worked in industry for Rio Tinto Zinc as a chemist, so I got there as a chemist, and I worked with a lot of technicians who I was quite um, mesmerised by their skills and the way they did things, and so I got offered a job in the university as a chief technician in 1975, and thought I would really like to get involved and work with that community. So. From 1975 till today, uh, I've gone through various routes and barriers and closed doors uh, to become, uh, first of all, a departmental manager, and then a laboratory superintendent, and then a director of analytical services, and just got more and more, more, and more involved in my free time with the technical community through the Institute of Science and Technology. So, although our paths might be a bit bumpy to start with, and we get distracted by other things, if you have that goal and the dream, you can achieve it. Anybody can achieve it if they decide, that's where I'm going. Why well, I'm one of these people that look at something and think, can we do that better? Can we make that better? And the only way you could start to get involved with that, and for people to listen to you, you had to sort of move to the other side of the table so you could sit down with managers and decision makers and say, well, I can influence this. Hmm. So that was the way I wanted to go because I wanted to see better opportunities for technicians, but I wanted to see the laboratories modernise, the way we do things modernise. So I decided I'll sacrifice that to go for that. I'm blown away by when you speak to technicians and what they do or academics, what their research is. It's fascinating. Yeah. It, it's you know a world of mystery and that mystery gets uh, exposed into why these things happen. It just and you enable you. that. You enable enabler. That. Yeah. Yeah. So um, you need these, what are now multi-million pound facilities, to be working at their optimum and that your technical staff are well trained 
and they're also involved and part of the team. So that's how the Science Council awarded me as one of the top 100 scientists, but in the operational category. Right. Uh, for all the work we've done and developments that we've done here at Sheffield. So. But yeah, it's quite amazing that they have an operational category. Yeah. So if you can imagine, a, a, a faculty of science is full of major facilities that's working at the cutting edge of research. And um, to organize these, which were into millions of pounds, hundreds of people, uh, becomes quite a task to direct, to ensure it's efficient and it operates correctly and it meets standards and it conforms to rules and regulations. So it's like running your own company. Yeah. Really. Uh, and so you take pride in that and you want it to be the best and to set, really become a pathfinder for the universities and companies to yeah. have that structure or have that model. What is it about enabling people that inspires you so much? Uh, I think it's not just the people that you see in the media or whatever. I think one of the things that really affected me was uh, in my late teens, early twenties, I volunteered to um, help out with underprivileged children. And at the time, I was very good at sport and I played badminton and squash and all sorts of stuff. And these children, uh, didn't have anything to do in the evening. They were more or less, because of their unfortunate social background, were just pushed out on the street in winter or whatever until they were allowed back in the house. So, again, I persuaded some people that if they would lend me their school hall free of charge, I'd provide badminton rackets and what have you. And we used to take these kids in. And, first of all, they never trusted you because they having difficult lives but when they did and you got them to open up and you spoke to them and you asked them what their aspirations were and they say you know I want to be a ballet dancer or I want to be a scientist or I want to be an astronaut they got this dream and and you could see that despite all the hardship and everything we're going through in fact they were quite inspiring just to, you know, that age and innocence and all the rest of it, to, well, if they can do it, and they still want to do it, d despite all their difficulties, I'm in a more privileged position, you know, why can't I get my dream? 